right, on this Garlic Marketing Show, we're going to talk about what to do when you lose the pitch, how to use that to get better. I've got Jim Nowakowski of Interline Group. Jim, say hi. Hello, everybody. And we're going to talk about the two things that he's used to grow his marketing business, how direct response has changed and how direct response affects emails, how he got 80% open rates on his emails, how he's getting leads from SEO, how he's thinking about it, what to do when you lose a pitch, of course, like we talked about, and how to win from it, why B, B markers should not send out surveys, the value of the pause, the power of back pocket full of stories, and just storytelling in general, as well as what he did for Tem Temple Shalom and uh, their marketing plan, and how he's using CEUs, how he's filling them, and using them to get in front of architects, in front of all sorts of designers in a B2B market. All this on this Garlic Marketing Show, but of course, this is brought to you by VideoCaseStory.com. And if you wanna learn how to have a collection of stories, how to collect them, how to use them in your sales, how to generate them, just go get the new book, Video Testimonials that Land the Big Fish. We'll learn all about that. Um, just go to TestimonialBook.com. All right, let's get started. If he's been doing this for a few years, uh, Jim, you've been doing marketing for what, 18 months? Uh, yeah, about that, plus a few 30 years on the top of it, yeah. Uh, positioning me properly in the terms of the age, I appreciate it. <laughs> yes, definitely. You're just slightly older than a millennial, uh, but that's all right, so am I. <laughs> and with that comes a lot of experience, and I want to talk about these few things about how you're using CUs, but let's talk quick, look quickly about your history, because you've done a lot in the marketing biz. I, I, once I left teaching after 10 years of being fired for defending a kid, which is another story, I got into advertising and my last full-time job before I started my own business was the creative director of the eighth largest direct response agency in the country. And this is way before internet and all that stuff. But once I started my own company, I really realized in direct response, and that's why I talk fast. It's really about two things, service and unduplicated knowledge, which were the two pillars I built my company on. Because as I learned early, service is the key. Uh, if you can serve people in a way that they can't get anywhere else, you're going to keep them as a customer. And then you need this unduplicated knowledge, which prior to the internet, it was, it was easier. You know, because the internet, of course, you go to Google and Google knows everything. But having unduplicated knowledge, someone once told me early in my career, you don't make money with things everybody knows. You make money with things nobody knows. And to a sense, that's true. But what most people forget is they already know what no one else knows. And you're saying, Jim, what are you talking about? I'm really talking about what they know, which is their unduplicated knowledge. I was talking to an architect as an example the other day, and he says, I'm just an architect. And I said, what are you talking about? You're just an architect. And then he starts, I said, you're very different. Just tell me what he specialized in educational facilities. 15 minutes later, he was telling me and realizing how different he is from other architects who practice in that field. So it's really a matter of sitting down and understanding people. And that's why, quite frankly, we're still standing after 30 years. You know, I built the company up to 25 people. Now we're down to nine or 10. That's through attrition and retirement, not because of 9-11, not because of the depression of 09, because of all that. But here we are, we're still doing something right which to me, I keep pinching my cheeks. I don't know what it is. I think I know what it is, but it's just yeah. working. And it's it's knowing your customers and yes. taking good care of them. It's the most, I don't think that's gonna go away anytime soon, will it? Well, the secret, what you just said is true. And what we found very early, because we're in business to business. So it's a, it's a little different than B2C, we're in B2B. And I found out very early, if I know my customers better than they know them, it's really hard to fire me. No, it's true. That's the number one thing. That's my skill set. I think that's the best marketer skill set. The greatest marketers, especially direct response marketers, they'll talk about it. They just know that person inside and out. Yeah. And then it makes it super easy to talk about their problems and sell to them. And you, know, and you mentioned direct response. How much, you know, you're working in B2B and you're doing B2B sales for yourself, obviously and you're doing B2, other B2B sales, business to business sales, but a lot of people wouldn't consider direct response being incorporated into that. I mean, is it still a big part of your business? The definition of direct response has changed simply because of email and all that stuff. In my, <laughs> in my day, it was mailing a million pieces out 
and looking for a 2% response rate. You, you do it. You know, everything was done very difficult, but that was direct response. You mail 100 out, 10 back, 10%. How do I improve? Once the internet hit and everything is now digital, it's the same principles. As a matter of fact, email marketing follows the principles of direct response. Almost a, it's, it's almost a direct correlation. Change the subject line, test, test, test all the time. The problem is people are deluged with, with email today. That's one of the reasons my client earlier said, well, nobody will pick up the phone anymore because they're being deluged because of the digital highways that are out there. In the old days, there weren't that many things. You get a letter in the mail, you can look at it, you can open it or throw it away. Today, you're getting email, you're getting phone call, you're getting spam. I mean, your phone identifies it as a potential spam call nowadays. So it's very, these channels that are out there, it's all direct response. It's all targeted marketing. But when these, when people make the mistake of thinking they could say, for example, the same message to all their audiences, that's a huge error because everybody, for example, we do also public relations, right? One of the dirty, I'll share a secret, okay, whatever is to niche your message, write a core release, and then niche your message to the different audiences you're aiming at. As an example, we have a client, a major association, and we did that for them earlier this year, where they were with another agency or whatever, but when we found out that they had this need, I made a proposal. They said, this looks good. Let's try it. Of course, there's a trust factor already because we were, we have a major project with them going on now, still even today for the last five years. But all we did is we took their messages, which were unbelievably good messages, sustainability, things like that. And we just niched them. We took them and just dialed a little bit differently for each of the different markets. As an example, they play in the kitchen and bath space, right? So that's easy. That's their core market. But if you take that same message and you switch it to real residential real estate agents, they don't want to read the same thing the kitchen and bath guy reads. They want to read something different. So you change it. You just modify it slightly. We had, this is bragging, but I might as well brag. I'm on your show, right? The client, I couldn't believe it. I was getting 80% open rates. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know what the reason I don't believe is? you. <laughs> I'll show you the statistics. And I believe you. No, you shouldn't believe me because I'm a marketing guy, right? <laughs> all no. marketers are liars. Seth Godin said, right? <laughs> no, it's, we all stretch, right? We're like, I was a fisherman. How'd you do? Oh, you should have saw that fish. It's huge. In any case, the open rates led to additional members because they had, they've been playing in their core but they never really went outside that core. And when you go out, it's that staying in your lane thing that I was referring to earlier. You don't want to stay in your lane all the time. You got to switch that lane, but don't just switch it with the same car. You know, if you're on a racetrack and you're driving a Volkswagen, get out of here. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's true. You've got to be ready to switch. You've got to be ready to adapt and it, you've got to do a lot. So you've adapted over the years. And also, I'm sure you haven't won all of your pitches. How? Tell me about, you, you wrote an article that really gets a lot of traffic. I, I want to talk about that article, but first I want to talk about how you're using it because you're getting a lot of traffic from attorneys who are looking that up, aren't you? I am. I don't know why I'm not an attorney. I deal with attorneys, but I'm not an attorney. One of the things that I realized, as I said, service and unduplicated knowledge. So when the internet came in and all this digital disruption, I, I realized early, and this leads to the answer to your question, that somehow we have to differentiate ourselves. Everybody has to differentiate. You have to differentiate. Everyone in your audience has. What is my different? What makes Interline Creative Group different than any other agency? Well, one of the things is superior SEO in the digital world. You know, that's the j jargon, right? Search engine optimization, whatever that. If you were to Google, what should I do if I ever lose a pitch? Should, what, what should I do when I lose a pitch? I'm in the first grouping that Google gives you. Only because I wrote this many years ago. And so I use that as positioning with our clients. 
basically saying, because you got SEO guys coming out of the woodwork. Oh, I can help you with the SEO. You get, e I'm sure you get emails. Hey, Ian, uh, give, me, <laughs> give me your business and I'll drive up your search, right? Mm -hmm. You want to know the secret of search? Content. Content is the secret to search. For example, what's one of the main things on B2B people's minds? Pricing, right? Pricing. Price, oh my God, should I raise my prices? Should I lower my prices? Guess what? Should I ever lower my price? Google that and Nowakowski's blog is in the first grouping. Nice. Because I have to demonstrate that I know what the hell I'm talking about before someone would even look at me. I'm not gonna get any traction coming in out of the clear blue like everybody else, especially with chat GPT. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Of course. This whole AI stuff is going to really, again, it's going to turn everybody on their back like turtles, like when they first came out with the internet, right? Oh, I'm a publisher. Print is king. No, it's not. It's changing. So that blog about what to do when you lose a pitch, everybody loses, but not everybody knows what to do when they lose. Some of them cry. Some of them commit. No, I'm kidding. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah. And, and that drives a lot of traffic, drives a lot of business. What should you do when you lose a pitch? Because most people, I think, just move on to the next one. <clears throat> you should find out why. Because the, people lose pitches for many reasons. And I'll, get, I'll give you an example. We lost a research pitch several years ago. And I all, the first thing you do is you call them up and you ask these questions. Why did I lose? Who was I competing with? Can you tell me? And you can read it in the blog, but they're basically basic questions. Why did I lose? Who did you, who was I competing with? Who did you give it to? And it's, it's outlined in a different way. So that's what I, every time I lose, that's what I do. I get on the phone and say, what, what happened? Can you tell me, can you share what happened? When I did that to this one client, it was for a research project. And I said, was it the price? Oh no, Jim, you are competitive. This was for $40,000 of a research project. Oh no, you're totally competitive. I said, oh. I said, was it the proposal itself? Oh no, Jim. You were the most comprehensive. Your company had the most comprehensive proposal. So now I'm really thinking the price is right. The proposal's right. What the heck happened? Was it Uncle Teddy? Did he come in from outside? <laughs> so I said, Beth, what was it? She goes, we just something, we wanted something more superficial. It's a direct quote. Huh. I said, Beth, thank you so much. Hung up the phone and started doing my dance because we don't do superficial. <laughs> I just yeah. don't. So until you talk to someone, you'll never know the truth. It, really, because often the truth hides. And there are Uncle Teddies out there that will get in and disrupt a pitch, believe yeah. it or not. Oh, yeah. No, you just never know. And I think that's, it's so important. That's what video case stories, we always talk about talking to your customers, knowing everything about your customers and constantly talking to them and having other people interview them. So you get this insight in interviewing, not sending, because if, if you just sent a, a survey, you'd have got nothing. Surveys are easy. You get that every time you shop nowadays, please fill out the survey, right? Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to say, you will never get on a survey what really, really happened. As an example, one day the programmer comes running into my office, Jim, Jim, there's a guy on the phone. He's yelling at me. Why are we calling him? Why are we calling him? So I said, let me put him on the phone. So I got him on the phone and he says, Jim, I don't know why you're calling me. I'm getting all these calls. I'm getting hundreds of calls suddenly. Can you tell me where you got my name? I said, Harold, is that all you want to know? And I told him where I got his name. I was emailing him something for a client <clears throat> and there was this pause. There, this is, another thing you shouldn't be afraid of on a phone is a pause. Like most people, oh, I gotta fill up the time with something. No. Let, let the side, you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, I learned that, I learned that a long time ago. It's a tough thing. It it's is tough. tough. It's tough, but the value is so there. But bite your finger when you're afraid that when you wanna talk, you should pause. Go like that. Yeah. So I pause and you just hear the sigh of relief. You didn't hear it, but you can sense it. That's why the phone is so powerful. You can hear the human being, right? Mm -hmm. Email surveys like you just pointed out. How do you think? 
He said, Jim, I can't thank you enough when we finally talk. I said, no, you're very welcome. And believe me, we're going to take you off the list. You'll never get another communication from us. No, no, no. I'm, I'm glad I understand now where all these people got my name. But let me tell you something. I'm not the guy. Now, this was a major retailer. <laughs> He's the architect for a major retailer in the United States. And he goes, I'm not the guy. The guy you want is Ben. And he gives me his phone number, his email. How do you do that in a survey? You yeah. can't. No, that's, and that's great. And uh, we'll put a link to that article in the show notes. But I like those stories. Like, it, how has that evolved your business and pitch over the years? Because it seems like it's probably one of the best things to do that. You know, when Facebook was invented and suddenly he changed it to stories, we've got to tell a story. Remember Zuckerberg? Oh, yeah, he's yeah. revolutionary. We've got to tell stories. Stories are as old as Homer. See, I'm an English major, and I grew up reading stories. And stories, when I used to teach underachievers, the way I controlled my classes, and I had no discipline problems after the first year, which was a horrific thing I don't want to talk about. But after the first year, the way you control children who are the Billy Badasses of the world, is you read to them. You read stories to them. Stories, you're, what you're doing with video is really bringing to life these stories. And I use them because over three years, you accumulate a lot of stories, good stories, bad stories. And I started putting these in 09 when the depression happened. Because if you remember 09, everything stopped. It was just horrible. So I decided I got to do something. So I started doing these blogs and those blogs have really sustained themselves because now when people say, Jim, you should write a book. No, just, they're all in the blogs. The stories are in the blogs. I got a story. I bet you there's not a topic. I shouldn't say that, but there's probably very few topics that I don't have a story from this, my business experience having sustained 30 years. It does, that's not there. No, not that I've seen everything. I'm sorry. No, but that's so important. I think that's, people think that it's like one story, but it's not. It's many different stories that you have in your back pocket, isn't it? That's the key. I, and the back pocket is so important. Keep every story. Like, Jim, why would you think, why would you even use that? It, my answer is always because you never know. And you never know, and that's why you keep all the stories, which is why sometimes I'm weighed down on the right here, because I keep them all. <laughs> you need to put them in both your back pockets. Yeah, and then you try to even them out, and you're still, you're growing shorter and shorter. <laughs> oh, no, that's true. It's so true, and I think that's, everyone wants that one story. I'm like, no. It's even the same story needs to be told in different ways, depending on the situation. Yeah, yes. And, um, and they're all and relevant, because they're te those really teach... The, there are experiences that have taught me what to do and what not to do. When I studied English, I had great teachers, and one of them told me, you should read, li you should read literature, cr classic literature, uh, which is what I studied, to see how other people lead their lives and how to lead yours. That was one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever gotten. And often people say, how can an English ma major be in business like you for so long? Oh, it's because in literature, you meet every type of person you can, as an example, Hamlet. Well, everybody knows Hamlet. I've met guys like Hamlet in business. They can't make a damn decision. They just can't make the decision. And what happens when you can't make the decision? Tragedy. So there's a transition to these stories that are timeless. I'm not talking about the dime novels or the Jack Reacher. It's a great, that's a good story, but... I don't know how that translates to business, but classic literature translates into business. It does. It, does. it really does. Yeah. It's, there's not a, there's very few stories that haven't been told. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun, Ian. You know that, right? Yeah. No, I know. And that's but you have to have those stories in one place. And that's why I created that tackle box toolkit was so people can just put their stories in one place. So yes. you have them, you know them. And also that way you have something that you can hand off to a salesperson and they can have your stories. Yes. Yes. And so I'm going to switch directions because how do stories lend into CEUs and how do you market your business with CEUs, continuing education units, credits, like a CLE? That actually happened again because of 09. When everything stopped, we were looking for different ways to market ourselves and CEUs emerged. And being a teacher, it was like just a natural fit. 
So we became IA, IDCEC, and NKBA provider of these courses. And the courses that I do are really marketing courses. They're not things on, for example, there's lots of CEUs that an architect will take on paint and structure, steel versus cement. My courses are strictly on that soft stuff, the intangible selling, because they're all great creative people, but often they really don't know how to sell or how to use social media. Here's an example. I had a, I did a social media webinar last week. And one of the questions from, I think it was an interior designer in there said she heard from a marketing consultant that says you should de-link LinkedIn and uh, your Twitter off of your website because you don't want, you don't want those on your website. You want the eyeballs. Mm -hmm. And she said, what do you think of that, Jim? I said, I don't think it's true, but there's a lot of marketing. You shouldn't believe me. You should listen to other people, but I wouldn't do it. Why wouldn't you do it? It was a chat dialogue in front of all the other people that were in the room. And I basically, well, if you, if you take those off, you're losing a chance to catch people. What do you mean? When you put a LinkedIn link on your website, where does that go? It goes to your LinkedIn page. Yeah. It's going to to your page. And you want, you got to expose yourself everywhere these days. You can't just say your web, your, by the way, your website is in fact the most mar important marketing tactic you have. Absolutely. But don't be listening to people that say to take these links off. You don't want to do that. No. So we had a great, she called me afterwards and we had a great conversation. So I, I agree with you completely there. And I want to talk about that for a second, because I think that's a big point is people are not going to spend their whole day on your website. Right? <laughs> they want to encounter you other places. It's like saying, oh, I'm not going to tell anyone where to go except for my office. If you're not going to my office. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. No. <laughs> they, my office. Yeah. You go out there and you network with people and it's a huge opportunity and that's where they're going to spend time and they're going to poke around and you. That's where you and I met. Yeah. LinkedIn. And that's where, exactly. LinkedIn. We met through LinkedIn and it's because if there wasn't any content on there, if there wasn't anything there, you wouldn't know who I am. You, I wouldn't know who you are. And most people aren't going to take the time to, to go to your website again. And time on websites has gone down. Now, I agree with you. The SEO and stuff is so important. But once they hit it, then they want to know more about you. And you should make it easy for them to find it and then bring them back. Unless you're a news outlet. And most designers and architects, uh, there are exceptions. Like the larger architects who have many people uh, have the, really the resources to generate new content every week. And, every, so they're, and they're constantly emailing. One of the biggest architects in the world is Gensler. They do a great job at this. They send out their dialogue newsletter every week, bring you back to the website. So that's really the key. What you're talking about is bringing people back to the website. But how do you do that unless you have these other channels? You can't. Exactly. It's impossible. It's impossible. It, exactly. No, you need to. And I, even and most that's I just had a conversation with the client the other day. I'm like, you are not a news store you're not a news <laughs> outlet but, well i used to work for a news outlet i'm like that's great that it's a completely different reason that someone's going to your attorney website that there's someone you know and i get to yes. have this conversation a lot especially with attorneys because they want their their 20 person law firm and they think everyone's just going to the website and reading everything i'm like they're not they're not and that's why you use integrated marketing you send people emails you send a newsletter out i constantly do that and that's what drives people to the website so it's a hard thing because everybody's interested in the ROI. What's the ROI on doing that, Jim? ROI, I've measured ROI way before as being in direct response. Like I said, 100 oh, yeah. out, 10 back, 10 back. I understand ROI, but in the B2B world where the average selling time for a product in B2B could be a year or more, there's no way to measure what an email will do at the right place at the right time. Hence, it's like carpet bombing. But with a degree of care, because people, including some of these professionals who get carpet bombed, they actually create other emails and they never, they will never see your message. You maybe think you're talking to them, but they'll never see it because they built in these walls. It's a, it's a very difficult problem. It is a difficult problem. But I, to your point earlier, you, even though you're spraying in quote unquote carpet bombing, you're still speaking to that exact person. Yes. In their language and with their problems and knowing them. 
All right. So tell me about how you get clients from, tell me about your strategy around CEUs to get clients. CEUs is most of our business because we're consultants and have been in, in an agency business and consulting world is really referral. So a lot of times when we engage with a client, depending how deep we penetrate that client, there's always like a lawyer, there's could be a conflict of interest. So we very, we're very careful about who we take on when we take them on. So as an example, the CEUs give us access to, as I was saying earlier, our customers' customers. So for example, all of our clients to the T, because I deal in B2B and our umbrella is construction and anything that leads to constructions. And one of those paths is architects, interior designers, engineers, they all lead to construction. Those are the people that my client wants to market to. Yep. So when I bring them into my audience, I learn all about them. I get relationships with them. So when I'm talking to my clients, I could say, oh yeah, I know so-and-so from Oh, you do. Can you introduce me? And the next thing I'm getting more projects from that client. So it's what you said earlier, Ian. It's a networking effect. It's a lot of times it's since COVID it's strictly digital, but it does work. It just takes longer. It's just that it's not the immediate, oh, I'm selling Snuggies. So here's my 1995. Give me my Snuggies. Exactly. It's a long, <laughs> it's a long process. You know, I wrote a blog, do you sell to a group or an individual? In the old days, you have the cigar guy behind the wall. He's the decision maker. Nowadays, it's, I don't even know if that's possible because people like to surround themselves in a group so they don't get that, oh, no, it's not my fault if it goes south. Exactly. So they surround themselves. So you got to talk to a lot of different people in different ways. That's the point, too. Yeah, exactly. I see that so much in our clients because you're selling to the unsellable. You yes. have to sell to everyone in that group and you have to speak to them and, and enable the, your champion in that group to have the tools besides just sending your website and comes back to, I hear this all the time, you know, that people are big companies are hiring from you or buying from YouTube because it's easy for everyone in the group to find what they have on that site. Everyone knows how to use YouTube. Not everyone knows how to use your website. You, Jimmy, have tons of great articles. It's it just, it's. We don't go to, a lot of people just don't even go to websites anymore. Correct. On a regular basis. Um, well, video is replacing reading. <laughs> Bravo for you, Ian. I know. <laughs> no, it, it's true. We're a visual, we've always been a visual society, but now, you know, it's like visualization on steroids with YouTube. Yeah. And you can get someone's content. And to this point, this is, you have great content, but now I get to hear Jim. I get to see Jim. Like, I remember reading your articles. And I was like, this is great stuff. I have no idea what Jim's going to be like. And then I met you. And I'm like, oh, he's, he's cool. And he's fun. And he's really interesting. Not that your articles didn't show that, but they were very in depth. So I don't know if you're just going to be a super nerd. And <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm a super nerd, uh, but I can hide behind a camera. So how many, tell me about your process. You're going out and doing these CUs. What's your process for getting them in front of people and getting business from them? It's all in the follow-up, you know, this as a, a sales guy, right? It's not really the CEO. I just told a client, like uh, we did for a client, our, one of our clients in the engineering world, and he had a really hot topic and he wanted to fill the room with a hundred people, hundred engineers. We actually had over 400 because the, it was, the topic was so hot, the lit in the direct mail hierarchy, the list, the offer and the creative, it's really, the list is the most important thing and the offer, and then the creative, although agencies flip it and they go, oh, you gotta be, oh, you gotta be entertaining. <laughs> nah, it's the list. And I got a story for that if you wanna hear the story. <laughs> but, I wanna hear it, I wanna hear it. All right, you asked for it. Many years ago, Temple Sholem is the largest Jewish synagogue in Chicago. And I was recommended by another guy to go talk to the executive director there. They wanna do a mailing. They were selling thousand dollar bricks in their new garden. Oh my gosh. They wanted to raise a thousand dollars, put your name on the brick for the garden. And so I talked to them and I listened to them and I created the, at that time, the traditional direct mail package, letter, brochure with a nice offer, thousand dollars. We'll put your name on the brick. I wrote it, everything out, brought it in. He looked at it and he picks up the phone and he calls Helen. I said, who's Helen? He goes, it's my assistant. So Helen comes in, nice 
lady sits down. He says, read this. And I go, oh my God, I'm in the hands of Helen. She reads my letter and starts crying. And I said, I'm either in trouble or she really likes it. And she finished it and she said, this is beautiful. They mailed it out and two weeks later, they had $100,000. Now, I could say it was my letter. If I was a typical agency guy, I'd say it was the letter, but it wasn't. I could say it was the brochure, it was beautiful. It couldn't have been the offer. It was $1,000 for a brick with your name on it. It was the list. I could have took the same package, mailed it to the Catholics and nothing would have happened. Nobody would have contributed anything. Okay. List is the key. That's so what true. we do is we target these lists very carefully. That's what filled the 400 people in this seminar, in this CEU, is they were targeted lists to engineers who are interested in that topic. It takes a long time. And unfortunately, we're in that, give me the bullet points. We're in that society, give me the bullet points. Yep. And I always say, would you rather be operated by the guy who read the book, the bullet points or the book? So that's why you, my blogs are longer than you may like, but it's really the key. Targeting takes a long time. It's not, you can't wake up and they're not going to beat a path to your door just because you are who you are. It takes a long time to gain trust, to earn trust, to keep trust. And you only do that by demonstrating your knowledge, that unduplicated knowledge. That's how you do it. And results, you got to produce results or as, my, my former client used to say, Jim, you're only as good as your last ad. <laughs> He's right. He is. He is. That's amazing. Did that answer your question? It does. It's the list and making sure you're, it, but also you have a good offer with that matches the list. Yeah. And of course, the instant message, but the creative is the least important of it. And that's really what we struggle with is our offer, because what, do, what am I offering to solve a problem? but I don't even know the problem you have. That's the difficult time that I'm facing nowadays. Everybody thinks they can solve the problem. <laughs> they go to Google, they look, oh, okay. Yep, no, you gotta figure out that problem. And that comes back to talking to your customers. What's the yes. problem you're really solving? Yep. Because it, that, you all should talk to the people that whose pitches you won and why did you win it? <laughs> yes, yes. Why, why you won it is as important as why you lost it. Exactly. 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 We just get signed on the dotted line and we move past that. And it's one of these absolutely powerful, incredible moments. And everyone wants to get, figure out where the lead's coming from. But no one's spending the time to figure out why the pitch is converting. Yes. And, and that's a hell of a lot more important. Is it? Well, either... <laughs> in, in direct response, they used to call response rates and then conversion rates. I've always judged conversion rates to be more important than response rates. Response rates, it's easy, but converting that response into a customer is harder. So conversion rates, if you got a good conversion rate, you're doing, you're smoking, but that's hard to do. Cause like I said, sometimes it's a year or two before somebody makes a decision in my world. Yep. Yeah. It's work. So you should probably pick up the book, video case stories that test testimonials that land the big fish and do that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but anyways, yeah, Jim, this is awesome. We'll put a link to Interline Group. We'll put a link to your blog post. Where else? And you're on LinkedIn too. So we'll put a link to your LinkedIn. Uh, is there any other place that you love to lurk in the internet? Well, what I'd like to do is once you post this, I'd like to put it out on my social media platforms and drive my audiences to view this. Would that be all right? That would be amazing. We would love that. Um, no, it, because that's really part of why I want to do this is really, and really the key is exposure. The more you expose, the, the more chances you have of somebody listening and saying, oh yeah, that might be interesting. And that's all it is. I'm because I'm so old. No, I, I really doing this because I love it. I don't need to do this, but I love doing it because I learn every day. I, like today, I, or last week, I learned something about a big corporation. This is a huge thing. I was trying to do this deal for since May 4th. I was trying, I don't even want to talk about it because I don't want to expose it. But I did blog about it pr previously. It's called Powerlessness in Customer Service. And it's one of my blogs. It's People read that blog, not as much as they lose the losing pitches, but they do read that. 
It's about a big organization who is so big, they can't deal with a smaller organization like us. I'm really serious. It was astounding to me. The difficult, I had nine people working on this problem since wow. May 4th. And they eventually said they can't do it. I should go and do it myself at the local <laughs> branch. That's crazy. What? It's crazy. Super interesting. So yeah, we'd love for you to share this. We'll put a link to all this in the show notes. Uh, Jim Nowakowski. Uh, I feel like I'm saying your name wrong, even though I know what to say it. Jim Nowakowski. You won't forget that name anyways. Uh, thank you so like much. Saying, you can call me Ray. So we'll put a link to all this in the show notes. Uh, and Jim, thank you so much for being on the Garlic Marketing Show. Thank you, Ian. Great, great talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for taking Jim and I on your journey. It's been I and Garlic and the Garlic Marketing Show.